All right, everybody, welcome back to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. Um, this afternoon, we are uh, going to take a look here at an amendment to uh, the Waterbury Charter. And welcome back. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Tucker Anderson, Legislative Council. Uh, you have draft 1.1 of the committee's amendment to H801, which is the Waterbury Charter. It amends section two of the bill in section one of the charter to add a new sentence at the end of the authority for the local option tax to state that the tax shall be collected and administered by the Department of Taxes pursuant to 24 BSA section 138, which is the general law provision covering local option taxes. The purpose of this amendment, as was discussed by the committee at the last meeting concerning H801, um, this will tie all of the procedures under general law for the collection of a local, local option tax to what is adopted in Waterbury. So that includes, for example, the 70-30 split, the 90 days notice, following quarter collection of the tax by the Department of Taxes, the entire kit and caboodle. So it just brings it in alignment with every every other charter that we correct up there by saying that. Yes, every charter in recent years, let's say, has had this provision added in to make sure that the charter local option tax is not interpreted to be different from what general law requires for the adoption of a local option tax as far as the collection of the tax and the administration of the local option tax program. So I was just asking under since I'm reporting, I believe I said I'd report this right. Yeah. I don't want to make sure you need to, didn't need to go a 20 minute dissertation on why we got arrived at that, which I'd have to use you as phoning a friend to do such. But you know, is it necessary? Perhaps not. Do the people want it? And then another question, 20 minutes on local option taxes. Who knows? Yeah, I think we phoning a friend if that's the case. <laughs> The, the easy way to, to talk about this in the floor report as amendment would just be to say that this is the usual language. Standard, exactly. Standard language to, to conform with all other modern day charters or something yeah. like that. Questions called Tucker Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, needing to remember if... Um, we, do we need to take separate votes to adopt the amendment and the bill. This is a, think, yeah. So I think if if we want to adopt, if if we want to just have one vote as amended, to yeah uh, adopt the bill as amended by draft one point one, I think that that's fine. So moved. I haven't done that. Are you at that point? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> so Representative Mor Morgan has uh, moved that we find. Uh, H801 favorable, uh, one amended by draft number 1.1. Is there any further discussion on the Waterbury? <laughs> Thank you for volunteering to report the bill. Representative Morgan, you're uh, carrying more than your weight. Uh, <laughs> to the and, and this bill, so appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a mark. Everybody's crunchy after lunch, so let's let's <laughs> we're, so we, there's a motion on the floor. Is there any further discussion? Clerk Shell. Representative Byron? Yes. Representative Boyden? Yeah. Representative Hango? Yes. Representative Morgan? Yes. Representative Fritbert Burlington? Yes. Representative Murphy? Yes. Representative Chase? Yes. Representative Waters Evans? Yes. Representative Cooper Randolph? Yes. Representative Nugent? Yes. Representative Higby? Yes. Representative McCarthy? Yes. 12 years. Yeah. Thank you. All right. All right, see, now we're running two and a half minutes early. That's the kind of efficiency yeah. that you come to expect. <laughs> it's great. So um, I, this is the rare opportunity for us um, to hear from foreign dignitary in the House Government Operations and Military sure. Affairs mm -hmm. uh, as we consider H667. I think we're um, just a couple minutes away from our scheduled time, and uh, I think the sponsors of the bill are going to be joining us. And to be hearing from back from the Apropos background, the administration, you know, two flags. So, 
on the first group of everything. <laughs> Senator Daly, we're uh, waiting on our bill sponsored. So welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us. We'll... I suppose, Chairman, they're on Irish time, are they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have to ask this, but is himself at home? He, I, he, I don't know, is he at home? But like, <laughs> I, I'm hoping to go home soon. Actually, you know what? Sorry, lads, no. I for, and ladies, I forgot to put on my jacket. I've lost the whole <laughs> Uh, what a meeting, like, geez, my mother would kill me. Like, <laughs> put on my... Now, see, now, if you're going to an event, event, you better be properly dressed and stuff. How are you doing? How is the weather in Vermont? It, <laughs> we have finally had a couple days of sunshine. Uh, January was the cloudiest month uh, since the 1950s. So uh, we, we had almost no sunshine for the entire month. And now we've had a couple of days of sun, but it's very cold. It's uh, about 15 degrees out, I think. Ouch. I mean, like when I was there, it was like epic cold, but from my <laughs> point of view. But like in, uh, in my part of Ireland, like, you know, the way Johnny Cash sang about 40 shades of green, yeah. which is about Ireland. Um, you have to earn 40 shades of green. Like, you know, it has to rain a lot. And in my part, in my part of Ireland, it rains 264 days a year. Now, it doesn't rain every day, every day. Like, it just, it, that we don't get, like, that kind of punishment. But, like, you have to earn that level of greenery. And God knows we earn it. We earn it. Like, we, But, like, it's like, you know, it's nice rain. It's soft rain. It's kind of like comes sideways, comes out of kind of direction. So anyway, uh, I, I appreciate the, the fact that you have so much cloud cover. Hopefully it'll, the, 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 the sun will stay with you. Um, so committee, we, uh, when we get our bill sponsors in here, um, we'll be taking up uh, H, uh, this is 667. Yes. And um, so that's why we uh, invited Senator Daly to come and join us today. And so I really appreciate you uh, being willing to, to zoom in and uh, provide a little bit of context for this proposal. I believe here we have our bill sponsors <laughs> right on time. Um, so <laughs> yeah, you're only a, a small bit, mate. Like, just a small bit. Just a small bit. Hi, Connor. Hi, Heather. Yes, so uh, I'm going to, would you, uh, Representatives Casey and Chase, like to come together? Is Representative yeah. Casey going to? Yeah, 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 right. yes. uh, if you'll tee this up for us, I think what I'll do is uh, have you testify, um, and then we'll have um, Legislative Council walk us uh, through the bill after we've gotten the context of what this is all about. So. Oh, really? So I, I don't think we're the main attraction today, so I can keep it short. It's a uh... green tie on you. <laughs> Best opportunity. It's a book of tell. Uh, but great. Thanks so much for having us, everybody. It's uh, Connor Casey uh, from Montpelier here. Heather Chase from Chester. And really excited to come in today to uh, present the Ireland Vermont Trade Commission. This has uh, really been something we've been working on for the last couple of years here. Um, and it began actually with the establishment of the uh, American Irish State Legislative Caucus. Um, of which uh, has, has been formed in all 50 states at this point. And uh, I'm looking at Representative Nugent, but we were lucky enough to have uh, seven members go over to Dublin uh, this previous August here, uh, visit with uh, you know the Minister of Trade, various other Irish ministers. Uh, Senator Daly took us on a field trip up to uh, Belfast, you know, to be with some of the counterparts up there. And uh, one thing we would say, as dysfunctional as the Vermont legislature is on any given day, uh, the Northern Irish Parliament hasn't met in two years, right? <laughs> because of the power sharing agreement. Uh, so so we, we, we were able to cover quite a bit of ground there. Uh, but really, just want to bring it back to um, this bill. And this is a bill that's currently pending in about 30 states. It's been introduced. And it's passed both in West Virginia and New Jersey. And uh, bipartisan sponsorship, I think, in every case here. And it was actually a beautiful thing, you know, Heather and I, Kate, when we were over there, we were sitting with people we often disagreed with, like from all around the country here. But one thing we agreed on was sort of the 
the, the, the uh, love for Ireland and the, the ties that bind us uh, to Ireland from our various states here. And Vermont has a very special relationship with Ireland. Uh, first off, we're the fourth most Irish state uh, in the country with 17% of Vermonters claiming Irish ancestry. Uh, you can walk through the halls of the State House, and one of the first people you're greeted by is Matthew Lyon, who is our, our famous congressman elected from uh, jail, right? Uh, but also born in Dublin. Uh, better distinction there. Uh, Senator Patrick Leahy, who we were talking to some of us last week, um, and mentioned uh, mentioned this bill, uh, was one of the architects of the peace agreement uh, and the Good Friday Agreement um, over in Ireland, and was just really instrumental and making sure we never return to the troubles that we had before. Uh, you can go back very far, and Ethan Allen, uh, while he was on a British prison ship, uh, it stopped off, off the coast of uh, Cork, and uh, he was housed there for a period of several weeks. And, and while there, Ethan Allen was a prisoner, and he was visited by the local Irish, uh, and given a, a lovely tweed suit that he always remembered that day forward because the Irish uh, appreciated that Ethan Allen hated the British probably even more than he did, so, <laughs> or, or they did. So, uh, so th there's great history here. Um, this bill is a very short bill, you'll notice, and a couple of key components of it is there's no appropriation attached to it. Uh, this is not meant to be funded on the banks of Vermont taxpayers. Um, it, it would be a commission that self-funds, and, and Hannah can talk about it a little bit. We say Irish Trade Commission, uh, but when we say trade, it's not necessarily economic um, solely. And that's why commerce kicked it here. Uh, you, know, you know, certainly we can look at the benefits of the European Union. Ever since Brexit, uh, Ireland is the only English speaking country in the European Union. Uh, currently home to 900, Senator Daly can correct me, uh, 900 American businesses, and is the gateway to the European Union. So from an economic basis, uh, it's a great place to do business. But in addition to that, you know, you look in Vermont, we've got the Burlington Irish Heritage Festival, which brings acts from Ireland every year. Uh, we've had great exchange programs with the University of Vermont, uh, bringing guest professors over. Um, and, and I think uh, Vin, Vince Feeney, who some of you might know, uh, taught Irish history for years up at UVM uh, and was really interested in this bill as well. So again, it's a pretty nimble commission, uh, three appointed from the governor, uh, three appointed from the House, and three appointed from the Senate. The thought was, give us a shot, you know. Uh, not, again, not ask, asking for any money, come back in a year with a report, and, and see what we can do to really build some of these ties between this state uh, and, and a country that's given us so much. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I'd hand it over to Heather there if you have anything else. I don't really have anything to uh, add. Uh, but but like, what very, like we, we, we did have, it was first presented last year in, in commerce. Right. And I think we got a bit too cute with it. So we tried to really Vermont right size it and say, okay, we don't need a staffer for this. Uh, we don't need to do what New Jersey's doing necessarily or West Virginia, but you know, we can do it and uh, maybe build it from there. So, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Great job. <laughs> yeah. I'm like a wind up toy. I'll keep like talking yeah. if you pull the but strings. If you have so, any uh, questions, I'm super supportive of it. Um, the trip to Ireland was very informative. I think it could benefit Vermonters and Ireland. And we do have that long heritage. Um, and, you know, I'm very supportive of this. The other reason I'm super supportive of it is the gateway to the EU. And a lot of that has broken down for Vermonters and U.S. companies because of Brexit. So um, that's a real attractive um, component of this. So I'd ask for your support and thank you for your time. And I'll just leave you like just a personal note there. You know, I, I grew up um, on the border of Ireland, Northern Ireland in the 80s during a very turbulent time. And, and I remember like you'd be sitting in class and the desk would start shaking, right? And you'd be like, uh, uh, please sir, is it an earthquake? And the teacher would be like, oh, no, lad, it's just a custom station being blown up down the road, you know? So, like, it was a very scary time. And, you know, I remember, like, moving to America and then moving back and, and seeing, like, the barracks down, the British soldiers gone, and, like, no hard border, like the border where we were harassed every day when we went shopping. And it really was the American intervention and the ties that America has with Ireland that brought about that peace. 
And, and it's so important to keep that connection to make sure we never return to those days again. And I, I think a commission like this goes a long way to do that. So thanks for, thanks very much. All right, uh, Representative Hooper and your hand goes. Uh, good day. Uh, I'm supporting this because I seem to have dried up on my connection to the mint chocolate Bailey's Irish cream. Will there be some provision in this for a, 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 a more direct conduit? <laughs> we did have, uh, I saw on the shelf, Representative Hooper, uh, didn't even plan this, but Papa Guinness mac and cheese was on the shelf the other day. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> my God, but like if the bill comes to the fruition, we could be eating that every day. That's great. Mm -hmm. Very careful that the commission not do anything that violates any of our Department of Liquor <laughs> and Lottery. Yes. Oh, 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 no. Completely appropriate. Just, uh, uh, you know, under the table is fine. Representative Tango, please say this. Thank you. Um, am I under the impression, if I recall correctly, that there are one or two other trade commissions that Vermont has entered into? I think Canada might be one. Do you know what others? No, I, I'm, I'm positive there have been several different types of commissions with the Quebec sort of uh, cross-border alliance there. Uh, the, the most recent sort of exchange program would be uh, one that Governor Scott uh, brought in with apprenticeships with Austria. You probably saw that a few weeks ago. Uh, so it's great to see that there is an appetite for it. And, um, you, you know, somebody asked in commerce, like, do we even need like a legislative approval for this? I, I think it does mean a lot that the legislature actually appoints this group of nine people with the governor to give it that gravitas to sort of go over there and actually meet with ministers on the level as sort of government officials or quasi-government officials. <laughs> Uh, Representative Chase, and then no. um, Thank you. Uh, do you know what kind of coordination or uh, effect would be between um, ours and the other states or the federal level? Um, like if there's any uh, preemption from the federal level or would this be coordinated in New Jersey or uh, West Virginia? Yeah, I think because it's fairly yeah. new, you know, the commissions would be talking to each other pretty regularly, right? It's, um, I, I think New Jersey just passed was it last year or the year before at the most? Senator Daly can tell you. Um, but, you know, even though it's going to be a smaller scale, I, th I think we can certainly learn from them. And, and obviously different industries in every state, too, uh, might be distinct. Uh, given your background, uh, said, uh, Representative Chase, you know, uh, Ireland has been a leader sort of in some of the technolo technological uh, advancements there. So as far as, uh, you know, bringing some of those groups together, I think, uh, Representative Priestley has been big on that in the Commerce Committee. Cool. Thank you. I just wanted to say, even in little old Lowell, Vermont, there's quite a nexus to uh, Ireland in that uh, we have Irish Farm Road and Irish Hill Road and the Murphys and a bunch of other names settled the area in, in Lowell. So pretty interesting. Well, well, given your surname, sir, it's, uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're a son of Ireland yourself. <laughs> Great. So uh, I wanted to um, give Senator Daly the opportunity to um, give your thoughts about how this is working and, and your support for commissions like this with other states. We're giving the full screen here. Thanks very much, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Connor, and thanks, Heather, and thanks, Chairman, and thanks to the members of the committee. Um, I think the... This idea came uh, from the visit by the New Jersey American Irish State Legislators Caucus, which at the time was less than a year old. And as Connor has pointed out, like there are now uh, Irish caucuses in all 50 states um, and they're open to everybody. You don't have to have Irish heritage to be a member. You just have to be a supporter of Ireland. And every month, uh, 2000 state legislators who participate and are members of the caucus uh, receive the monthly newsletter. Uh, outlining what's happening in Ireland, what's happening in the United States, and importantly, what's happening in Northern Ireland. And um, Connor referred to uh, Senator Pat K uh, Lacey. Uh, Pat Leahy was instrumental in the peace process, a quiet operator behind the scenes. And Pat Leahy <clears throat> is spoken about fondly here in Ireland uh, for his work in Washington, uh, ensuring that peace uh, has prevailed uh, because there are people alive in Ireland because Senator Leahy and others got involved but stayed involved in our peace process. Um, and that uh, peace process uh, celebrated its 25th anniversary last year. 
And when New Jersey came over, we brought them to Northern Ireland. Um, they they saw that the importance of continuing to support peace, and that is done through uh, political engagement and through uh, economic and trade engagement and education. And and what we're hoping to do is partner universities departments. So in Vermont, the university engineering department would be uh, partnered uh, with the engineering department in. Queen's University Belfast uh, or, or the University College Dublin and the state, you would have academic exchange and student exchange programs, which uh, University College Dublin already has with UCLA in California. Um, but what we want to do is what happened last August is that every August, the Vermont uh, Ireland Trade Commission members and the legislators and business community uh, and education community would come to Ireland uh, and would see, go to Northern Ireland, see the opportunities there, come to uh, Dublin. We're hoping to have, as part of this year's summit, it's not confirmed yet, um, with the commissioners and legislators uh, from across the, the United States, um, uh, a summit on AI in Google headquarters, uh, talking about the challenges um, that we're having in terms of artificial intelligence, trying to regulate that. So there's a lot of areas we can collaborate on, but the big selling point really is that Ireland is now the gateway to Europe. Um, having Britain, having left the European Union, as Connor said and Heather said, we're the largest English speaking country left in the European Union, a market of 450 million people. There are 900 US companies use Ireland as their aircraft carrier basically off the coast of Europe to access that market. And there's an American Ireland Chamber of Commerce here which could assist uh, with visiting in Vermont. Uh, accessing that market without having to navigate the colossal bureaucracy that is Brussels. Um, you're able to base in Ireland, uh, benefit from the fact that the Irish education system uh, has 70% of our high school graduates end up going to third level, uh, one of the highest, the highest in Europe, and benefit from that. But also Ireland is the ninth largest investor in the United States of America, which for a country of our size is quite impressive. But what we want to do is, like most countries tend to focus on the big states like California and, and uh, Texas and the Floridas and the Georgias and all those. Um, but Ireland, like Vermont, is a, a small country that has to elbow its way into the, into the world and keep ourselves, you know, we have to be nimble and, and scrappy. Um, and like what we want to be able to do with your assistance is help each other in terms of uh, assisting our our people in in Ireland and the people in Vermont in terms of uh, affording the best opportunities uh, in, in terms of economic opportunities and, and in other ways. And so this is a platform. And as Connor has outlined, the the legislation drafted by. Uh, New Jersey, uh, nothing like a good idea. Normally you have to ram a good idea down someone's throat, but in this case it was borrowed, repurposed by West Virginia, uh, and they passed it into law before uh, New Jersey managed to do so. And as Connor said, nearly about 30 states have it in various processes of passing. I just got the copy of the bill from Illinois uh, just there half an hour ago. And again, it's about building relationships, you know, and that's what having a platform a, and a structure where you would be invited over every year to Ireland. And what we then have is we we go to, we make sure that our ministers who have been informed by our Department of Foreign Affairs, you need to go to the other states. And as a result of West Virginia passing, you know, not just the Boston's and the Massachusetts and the Californias and those. And as a result of the West Virginia Trade Commission, the first Irish minister of state in a hundred years, in the history of our state ever to go to West Virginia, went to West Virginia because there was an Ireland Trade Commission. The next minister is going this July. And that's because there's a structure and there's, you know, there's, then now we have a, a way of continual engagement. What can often happen with trade missions and trade delegations is they go and nobody goes for another four years and the relationships are lost. What you need is continuity and uh, ongoing engagement. But Ireland, as Connor has pointed out, is the gateway to Europe. It's not a market of 5 million people. It's a market of 450 million people. Any questions for Senator Daly? 
Our committee is spellbound, Senator Daly. Yeah. <laughs> That's a first. <laughs> I remember the silence anybody in my life, even when I was doing cheering. Um, but no, I just want to thank the committee for the great opportunity. It's a great honor to, to be back in Vermont, if only virtually. Um, but it was quite a quite an experience to to be there uh, and really enjoyed uh, my time there. Well, I really enjoyed it uh, when you were here um, just a couple of weeks ago um, to be able to have lunch with you and the, just to know that there uh, is a senator of your stature in Ireland that is making the effort to bring uh, American and Irish uh, relations at the small state level uh, together. Uh, I really appreciate um, the goodwill uh, that you're bringing and we'll, we'll try to meet you halfway and I, I hope to be able to make it out there myself eventually. Well, we look forward to coming. And the good news is, just just so you know, and the latest update is, Starmont is back up and running as of last weekend. Uh, for the first time in two years, they managed to elect a speaker. They managed to elect a first minister and a, a deputy first minister. Uh, but don't <laughs> worry, they were all on the they were all on the payroll for the last two years while nobody did a lick of work. Um, but I wouldn't fly in Vermont. <laughs> Oh no, I did. I can guarantee you from what I know, know of Vermont and from talking to people there, uh, that would definitely wouldn't work. But the reason that it got up and running and it's slow stuff in Northern Ireland is the US kept at it, kept being involved. Uh, um, that's the very important part of it. Um, well, thanks for being with us. Uh, feel free to stick around and listen if you would like, but we know you probably oh, have other to. places to be. <laughs> no, no, you're grand. Like it's it's half past six here. Um, so I'm like watching, you know, this is like this is like Disneyland for politicians. Like what? <laughs> other people do business is always a great way because you'll always learn. I'm um, here to follow our YouTube channels. <laughs> <laughs> so get to like and subscribe. <laughs> I was, what I was hoping we might do is have legislative council do a quick walkthrough of the bill and, and then take your testimony if that's okay. Yeah. All right, great. Um, so I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Sagal to join us and walk us through uh, what appears to be a pretty short bill. So I think we can do this pretty quickly so we all know what we're talking about. And then, of course, uh, I've already flagged, but if we do move anything like this forward, we've got to put a sunset in here and also think about uh, how to fill vacancies. Those are two mechanical things. That uh, <laughs> we'll have to add if we do do further work on this. Yeah, well, uh, Rick Sagel, Legislative Council, thanks for having me back and Gov Operations. Um, so yeah, House Bill six six seven. This is the uh, bill that would create the Vermont Ireland Trade Commission. <laughs> Representatives Casey uh, and Chase did a great job explaining the why, uh, the how, and I'll just describe what I've done here uh, with the bill. So really starts here on the second page. Uh, the question earlier was uh, asked about a trade commission, how many we have in Vermont. We don't really have any created by statute. There are some that the governor has engaged in via executive order. <clears throat> this would be the first trade commission via statute, just so you all know, uh, with Ireland. So I created a new chapter, chapter 111B, uh, which would hold all of our trade commissions. This would be the first one, the Vermont Ireland Trade Commission. Uh, so part A of 4129, establishes the commission and who makes up the commission. You have nine members, three appointed by the governor, three appointed by the speaker of the house and three appointed by the president pro tem for the Senate. Then you have the purposes of the commission, uh, advancing bi bilateral trade and investment between Vermont and Ireland, initiating joint action on policy issues of mutual interest to the uh, two entities, promoting business and academic exchanges, mutual economic support, encouraging mutual investment, and on page three, addressing other issues as determined. So this language really is quite a bit taken from New Jersey and West Virginia. I think South Carolina, Representative Casey was also um, inspirational here. So we're not creating this from scratch, in other words. Subsection C, the members shall be appointed for terms of four years uh, and shall continue uh, until their successes are appointed, except we will do initially staggered terms. And you see there are three members by the governor will serve terms of two years, the three by the president pro tem four for uh, three years and by the, I'm missing the Senate there or the house. Let's see the governor two years. Yeah, I might need to figure out why the house members are not listed there. 
I'm going to note that for myself for section C. So, yeah, section C, I have the staggered terms for the governor and the president pro tem for, but the speaker, the house members are not listed there. When I'm reading that is that the house members would be appointed for the full four years. Um, the Except those two. Three years, and then the governor would be two years, and then their four-year term would start. Is that mm -hmm. accurate? That, that could be read that way. I, that's probably why I meant it, but in case it's a quick read, you may not catch that, which I just did. <laughs> so, yeah, we could leave it like that, or we could be prescriptive and say this is the house member terms. Subsection D, a vacancy shall be filled within 90 days after the vacancy. Subsection E, the commission shall select a chair uh, from among its members in the first meeting, and that chair may uh, appoint committees and subcommittees at the chair's discretion. A majority shall constitute a quorum. Subsection F, there shall be a report submitted by the commission uh, sent to the governor and the General Assembly within one year of its first meeting and on or before November 1st of each year after that. Subsection G, the Vermont Ireland Trade Commission is authorized to raise funds for direct solicitation or other fundraising events alone or with other groups and accept gifts, grants, bequests from individuals, corporations, last page there, foundations, governmental agencies, and public and private organizations and to defray the commission's expenses and to carry out its purposes, those funds can be used for that. The funds, gifts, grants, or requests pursuant to the section shall be deposited in a bank account and allocated annually by the ACCB to defray its expenses and carry out its purposes. So one thing to note there, uh, Representative Casey wanted to, and he mentioned this, that he didn't want the commissioners to be paid, right? Um, so in this kind of setup, we usually do pay members who are either legislative members or non-legislative members. So I think we want to make that clear that we're not going to pay them if that's the what you want to have happen in this bill. Uh, we probably need to set that and say these members will not be paid. Section two, uh, initial appointment shall not be made later than October 1st, 2024, and the act will take effect on July 1st, 2024. I have noted the sunset. Yeah, provisions. it sounds like there is a vac the vacancy pr provisions are in there. So I'm just yeah. flagging that as something anytime we set up a board or council commission, we've got to make sure we're thinking about. Um, any questions about just the words on the page at this point? I think we flagged a couple of things that already that we might need to clarify or tweak, but. Rick, Rick thank you very much. Sure you. Spot seats with Mr. Sagal. Thanks for joining us on this. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, for the record, Joan Goldstein, Commissioner of the Department of Economic Development. Um, I feel as though I might be the skunk at the garden party. Um, I would like to explain, I, I've not been before this committee, so I'd like to just explain a little bit about the structure of the department and how many we are, and so that you can get an understanding of where I'm coming from. <laughs> We're um, 28 people in total. That's extremely small by state government standards. I'm sure you've met many departments that are much larger than that. Uh, seven of those 28 are limited service positions, the most of which are being paid for by ARPA funds, and five of those are currently vacant. So the rest of the people, when you think about, we've got a commissioner, a deputy commissioner, two admin people, we've got certain government programs that are funded by the feds. When you come down to it, you've got like nine people handling 16 different separate distinct programs. And so, What's happened over the last couple of years, every so often we get gifted, I call it gifted, uh, a responsibility from uh, this great body and we end up doing it. And uh, I think we, it's fair to say that we're at full capacity, however small and however well-meaning the responsibility may be. And so I thought I'd also talk about how we do have a person, two people, one and a half kind of handling international trade and as a result of their work, um, they, we have developed some relationships with various entities associated with Ireland uh, regarding diplomacy, bilateral trade, and direct investment. Through the Vermont in International Trade Alliance, which is an association of Vermont private and public organizations, have initiatives in exporting, importing, foreign investment, and it's made up of like law firms, customs brokers, airports, federal and state agencies, and banks, there are established relationships with many European Union countries. Through active co collaboration with the Vermont Office of the U.S. Commercial Service, which is a, a department within 
the International Trade Agency, a federal entity. They basically have offices all over the world, anywhere we have diplomatic relations. The U.S. commercial staff based in Ireland and the U.S. Embassy in Washington, D.C., we've been in touch with them regarding trade missions, company business to business meetings, and market entry opportunities. So there may be small businesses that we help with exporting, larger businesses may have questions, we connect them with contacts within the respective uh, countries. In 22 and 23, the U.S. Ambassador to Ireland, Claire Cronin, met up with our team at the Select USA Foreign Investment Summit in Washington to endorse the potential of an Irish trade mission. We were very much in favor of that. The team has also met with the Irish Ambassador to the U.S., Geraldine Nelson, Nason, at the Irish Embassy to, to talk about Irish companies operating in Vermont. Um, and Vermont's International Trade Division also has direct contact with the American Chamber of Commerce, Ireland, based in Boston. The Council General's Office of Ireland, based in Boston, General Fitzgerald and staff are very accessible to New England states. Twice a year, the Vermont team meets with Mark O'Connell, CEO of OCO Global, which is a leading world trade firm who, based in Ireland that recruits mostly European Union companies to expand into the US market. The team has also met with Maureen Pace, president of the World Trade Center in Dublin, and her staff regarding utilizing their services and contacts when a trade mission is scheduled with Ireland. We've also met with the executive director of the Cork City Commerce and Economic Development Association about opportunities in County Cork uh, in southwestern Ireland. We've also met with Senator Peter Welsh's staff about the senator potentially accompanying some Vermont companies to Ireland and uh, his Irish heritage and also a follow a longstanding relationship with uh, Ireland as Senator Leahy had. So I just here to say that this is who we are, this is what we do. We, we're not sure there's a need to have a, another commission. As you know, sometimes those are hard to fill. The governor's got hundreds of them. It's not saying it's not a good idea. Be anything that encourages trade, but again, adding a, just another responsibility, however seemingly small, would, we would be hesitant. Uh, questions for Commissioner Goldstein? Seems fair to, uh, to characterize the administration's position as good idea, not sure ACCD is the home for this. I think there's a desire among the number of the legislators who been involved in some of the exchanges with some of our Irish counterparts to have some kind of um, official recognition of that and a, a place where they could raise funds into uh, that would be appropriate and appropriately managed. So if this isn't the right home, maybe there's another one, uh, but we can but we can work on that. Uh, questions, Representative Hendrick. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, could you answer the question about how many other trade commissions like this we've already entered into? Right. So we didn't have one for a specific country. We had the we had an international trade commission a couple of years back, and it was dissolved. It was dissolved because of lack of true specific mandate, and then they didn't meet as a result. And then eventually it was just dissolved because it didn't it didn't. Again, it's really, when we think about trade, it's usually a federal, we have relationships with all the federal contacts that have the relationships in the countries. Um, so that was dissolved, so we don't. We do have a very strong relationship with Canada. It's not really called a mission. We have trade missions that usually go to the country where there's a trade show, a global trade show happening, so that we could utilize some of our SBA funds to help pay to get to the trade mission because we don't have budget to just do trips. Um, it usually has to come out of our SBA funding for, we bring small businesses with us to encourage their contacts and export opportunities in the country. We're, and we usually look at the global trade shows wherever they're held. And we tried to do an Irish trade mission last year. We didn't get enough Vermont businesses actively interested. So we're gonna keep trying on that front. Um, our international trade rep is of Irish descent. And so there's definitely a theme of we want to we want to do this. We think there's a lot of commonality, uh, but the commission it sounds like uh, we'd be collecting money and then dispersing. We couldn't really understand, um, yeah, what 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 other purpose it would serve. And again, being responsible for it, we'd want to make sure that there's um, a true justification, that there's a, a mandate and some specific outcomes that have to come as a result. Just following up on that, thank you. So to your knowledge, there haven't been any other statutes put in place. Uh, I probably should have asked the attorney that. 
um, <laughs> um, that you that there haven't been any other statutes passed and put into place that establish trade commissions with any particular company. Uh, sorry, countries. Not that I could find. I did see the International Trade, trade. Commission mm -hmm. with the federal government's involved. Uh, we have that. But as far as Vermont, state of Vermont with other countries and provinces, we don't have that I could find any trade commissions. Yeah, it's it's a, statutory. Right. It's not like we had a Vermont Quebec alliance. There was an appropriation a couple of years ago. Lake Champlain Chamber was heading that. But uh, there isn't a formal thing statute. Like we obviously want to work with our trading partners and, and encourage export because. Vermont businesses need the export market to develop for sure. Mr. Thank you very much. And you're very welcome. Sorry to be this coming. No, no, I, I, I think it's fair to say we need to find the right home. And so um, that's not, not a huge problem. Um, so I guess I, I might ask um, if you, Representative Casey, if you and, and Representative Chase and others who might be interested in figuring out if ACCD is not the right home, maybe we can work offline in terms of how do we facilitate, you know, sort of what our big priorities are here. I think that's the, it, am I understanding correctly that the, the main goal of the bill is to create a formal home for some of the activities that we you know, want to finance and allow and sanction the happy. So am I understanding that correctly? Oh, absolutely. And uh, I already think that it's one of the places where this could be housed because, you know, as we said at the beginning, it's trade, but it's not limited to economic trade. So, you know, whether it be maybe like the treasurer's office could host something like that, that's fine. I think we're agnostic where the bank of town goes and, and absolutely sympathetic for the resources of ACC Dave. Uh, but we, we can kick around some options in the back there. Yeah. We really, really appreciate that. Um, I don't, uh, I, I definitely want to make sure that we uh, get it right and have kind of a willing uh, fiduciary agent or administrative partner. So uh, we'll work offline and try to try, try to find that spot. Um, any questions or thoughts from the committee before we move on to our next agenda item. Representative Chase. Thoughts? I'm in support of this. <laughs> this wouldn't make it uh, suspected. Okay. So okay. you're you're on the, the, the ad hoc uh, working group to find a home for the commission. Great. Thank you, Representative Chase, for volunteering. <laughs> mm -hmm. As long as you forget. Go ahead. Did you have your hand up, Representative Cooper? Only halfway. Okay. I, could, I, I felt I was like reading your body language. Just like kind of going. I think it's conferred with counterpart here. We thought maybe it might be housed in what control. Oh, man. This committee this week just full of comic relief. Um, and we're going to need it for uh, our two o'clock topic. Um, great. Well, I think we've got a few questions that we will have to answer on this one, but uh, the this was just our first little walk through and introduction. So appreciate everybody's uh, bringing this uh, opportunity to the table. Now we need to figure out how to make it happen. So Senator Daly, uh, we we'll wish you well. Um, we're thank gonna, you, Chairman. Thank you for being here. So we're going to um, just take a quick break um, and then come back right at two o'clock. Um, uh, we're gonna see some language uh, that is relevant to our jurisdiction that's being considered Means around the ed finance and uh, potential rewarming of school budget. So serious stuff at two o'clock. So we'll adjourn for a few minutes here and <clears throat> come back at two. All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, we're picking up our work this afternoon um, with some uh, language that is uh, a committee bill uh, that's being considered up in ways and means. Um, <clears throat> we've been asked to do a drive by um, since. Uh, it touches on our jurisdiction in the, I think what we're going to do um, is uh, first have legislative counsel. Um, Kirby and Tucker, are, are you going to testify jointly? Is one of you going to walk us through the language? 
think Tucker is going to uh, talk about the rewarding language and if you want background on the pack part, that's fun for you. Sounds great. Uh, so Tucker, do you want to come up and give us the, the run through on the pieces that are relevant uh, to GovOps? Absolutely. And if you do want any of the excellent tax information, I'll call Kirby over to hang out with me and bail me out on all of that. Good afternoon, you have in front of you a draft of uh, a Ways and Means Committee bill, should be draft 1.1, draft number 24-0670. And the components of this within the committee's jurisdiction are in section three, find that on page four, and it relates to uh, warnings for school district budgets for the upcoming school district meetings. So if you are with me, Section three and subsection A. The first thing that this does is authorize the legislative, legislative body of the school district to cancel the district's vote on budget articles for fiscal year 2025. So notwithstanding any provision of law to the contrary, the legislative body may cancel the district's vote on an article or articles related to the fiscal year 2025 budget and here's the limiting piece for the sole purpose of amending the proposed budget. Yeah, it's under Kirby Keaton's name. Oh, uh, okay, sorry. Who's it under Kirby Keaton? Kirby Keaton. Okay. So I have a question about pushing out the vote. So Representative Hango, since you just came in. Yeah, sorry. I... We're, we're going to hear what it is. And then, so actually, let me take a step back. So Ways and Means is considering a committee bill. The purpose of the bill, Herbie can speak to questions about that, but I'll give the kind of the why, are, why are we this particular bill and how does this is fit in from my layman's perspective. Um, so I'm sure you're all aware that uh, because of the kind of unprecedented pressures on school budgets, uh, the uh, budgets that were warned um, ended up being uh, much larger this year. Uh, proposals uh, much larger this year than were even anticipated back in December. Um, and they certainly, uh, the increase by and percentage was much higher than anybody contemplated when Act 127, the people waiting bill was passed. And what that did was it essentially broke the mechanism that was being used to kind of smooth out for districts that had been uh, historically advantaged in terms of having tax capacity in the formula before Act 127. Um, you know, they've been given sort of a circuit breaker and an, and an opportunity to essentially be able to spend above a cap um, and without having it affect their local tax rate. Well, the, with increased pressures on school budgets, many, many districts across the state had large percent increases. And so uh, the Ways and Means Committee is considering essentially saying, this isn't gonna work the way we thought it was gonna work in Act 127. We're going to change that mechanism. We're not here to review that mechanism that's changing. Uh, that's the first part of the bill, uh, but the part that we're, we've been asked to weigh in on are the mechanics of what happens if we allow districts who, you know, are now seeing a new formula to cancel their budget vote and do a new election. So what I wanted to do before anybody asks any questions, we get down a rabbit hole, is just have Tucker walk us through what the bill does in terms of the elections and the school budgets. And then I know we'll have a lot of questions and I just want to make sure we all get on the same page first and then we'll dive in. So, so there will be time for questions, I promise. <laughs> so go ahead, Tucker. I will back up a bit to make sure that we're all in the same sentence to start. So in subsection A, regarding the school district budget votes, notwithstanding any provision of law to the contrary, the legislative body of a school district school board here, may cancel the district's vote on an article or articles related to the FY 2025 budget for the sole purpose of amending the proposed budget. So these are the school districts that are going to amend the budgets that have been proposed. 
and for that purpose, are going to cancel the vote on those articles. I don't know what it means to cancel a vote. I think you can take it by its express terms. They're going to cancel those articles for vote at the district meeting. <laughs> what if the ballots have already been mailed out via absentee ballot, which they already have? The Secretary of State, and you will hear excellent testimony from Will Senate, has a plan in place for guidance that may be sent to local officials on how to alert the voters that it's going to be canceled. Part of the, that is in here, which is amending the warning to let the voters know that it's not going to be there. And reaching out to voters with the mailing of the ballots and subsequent information to let them know that this article is not going to be voted on at the district meeting, but instead at a later date. I'm going to just ask everyone to hold questions so that we can all get through what is on the page. And I swear we'll take questions. We're going to get great testimony from Will explaining. So if we can just keep it to the words on the page just until Tucker gets through and then we'll get into it. Go ahead. Next. The next provision in subsection A. This is for those districts that it have cancel the vote. The district that cancels the vote on its budget articles shall amend the warning for its annual district vote to state that the budget vote is canceled. <laughs> There's an express requirement that you amend the warning to stay canceled. <clears throat> and shall move the date of the budget vote to a date on April 15th. <laughs> Two requirements here. First, that you amend the warning to say canceled. And second, that you move the budget vote to a later date, which has to be on or before April 15th. April 15th is the deadline for these purposes for holding that vote. Okay. Those are the mechanics. Subsection B, there's an appropriation. $500,000 appropriated from the general fund to the Secretary of State for fiscal year 2024 for the purpose of offsetting election costs incurred as a result of this change. One thing that I'll note here, because um, it did come up in some of Will's testimony this morning, is that there's a piece here at the end that ties this directly to the movement of that bill suant to this section. And there may be districts that are able to use, for example, the Act 1 authority their annual vote in order to accommodate the new calculations who may need assistance as well. But I'll leave that to Will to articulate in better terms. Subsection C, this ensures that if there's any conflicting authority that exists in an educational charter or a municipal charter that requires, for example, specific warning timelines or warning procedures, that this temporary authority will supersede those charter provisions and will allow those educational corporations to use this authority. So are there any questions just about the, the specific words on the page? I think what I'd like to do is take those questions if it's just about like a definition but the mechanics, I'd like to save questions about sort of how this will work until we hear Mr. Sutton's testimony. So questions about the specific words on the page. Representative Chase. Um, I think it's about this. If not, we can defer to Will. Um, you said uh, cancel the articles. Would that mean um, that only certain portions of it would be canceled and the rest of the vote would be held at the originally intended time? Correct, okay. including, for example, the district elections of their officers who are okay. eligible for the election. Thank you. Sorry. Who is subsection C? Who is the temporary authority in subsection A? The temporary authority is this bill itself. So the temporary authority that is granted under subsection A. Okay, that probably should say granted in subject section, because when I thought of temporary authority, I was thinking of some kind of temporary body. Okay. Representative Morgan, sorry. Is Will going to talk to the money? Yes. Okay. 
to him, so I believe so. I mean, I, I can't read Will's mind, but I assume he'll address that. Because that's a significant chunk of money. <laughs> so um, before Will does that, uh, maybe Kirby could tell us when we're looking at the at the Ed Fund, I think this is context, what in the conversations that were happening upstairs in Ways and Means, um, what kind of amounts are they talking about potentially having schools that take a look at this formula? What do they think the impacts in terms of reduction in Ed Fund pressure will be uh, if a number of schools take advantage of this roughly? Just want to get a sense of the scale because this seems like a lot, but I believe it's on the order of tens of millions of dollars in potential reduction in Ed Fund pressure. Sure. Uh, so Kirby Keene, Legislative Council. Um, the, the best person to answer that, answer that would probably be Julie, uh, Julia Richter from JFO. Just I want to I want to preface with that. But um, what I can tell you is that the other part of this bill that does pr provide some relief for a as a transition mechanism to new pupil waiting uh, would cost approximately the estimates are around thirty million. Uh, it also repeals the tax caps. If, if you're all aware of Homestead tax caps from um, Act 127, that would have cost far more than 30 million. Uh, I, I don't know the exact number. I think JFO would, because um, it's. I think that number is moving a lot as we learn information about what's going on with the school district. The five percent. The five percent cap would have. Uh, yeah, because a, seems like a lot of districts were taking advantage of it, and it would have caused. Uh, a, a quite a large hole that would have been filled by uh, non-homestead taxpayers and by whatever the General Assembly would do to, to address that hole also. Uh, so the expectation is that uh, without the 5% cap being such a, a huge relief, uh, that there will be, it's, it's speculative, so who knows how many school districts will take advantage, but uh, some of them that have very high budgets will lose that 5% and we'll, we'll need to go back, I would imagine, and, and come up with a new budget, potentially far less. And if that happens across several school districts, then that means that the entire system would have to pay for less. There would be a much smaller hole in the FF. So that's, that's why the um, Ways and Means is interested in this approach. Maple runs school district. And, uh, their superintendent uh, told us at a public meeting that had they done what many school districts had done and spent up to the point where it would have been impacted them, um, if they just spent everything that they could under the, the current Act 127 formula, it would have been an additional $5.7 million. So if you assume that there are a number of districts that sort of, I should say, used the formula, uh, I've heard some people talk about it's taking advantage of the formula, but it's, we're talking about tens of millions of dollars. So the idea here is to make an investment that'll potentially uh, have a huge relief um, on the Ed Fund if a number of districts go back and say, okay, we can't take advantage of what was in Act 127 um, because that formula no longer applies because of what's previous. So, so that's kind of the posse in the background here. More questions about Act 127 or have a need to learn more about the mechanism of replacing <laughs> the, the caps? I'm sure some more questions will come up. I think what we'll do is hear um, <laughs> Director Sen talk about the, how this is likely to play out because I know he's worked a bunch with uh, the Ways and Means Committee and you all alleged council to come up with this language. So we'll hear from him and I imagine folks will have more questions. So, Will, thank you are for you being ready here. for me. We are. Um, okay. Yeah, if you, I think if you could um, walk us through the Secretary of State's position on this and, and give the committee your thoughts on kind of how, how this will work in different districts that have different voting methods, I think that would be really helpful. <clears throat> Can do. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to take 30 seconds, maybe 20 only, just to start by thanking you all 
also for the resolution that you passed um, a week or two ago, whatever it was. I That was uh, really special for me. Really, really appreciated. The Secretary of State surprised me with my whole family in the chamber. Um, and I just, I, I worked really hard over the 10 years I've been here to have a good working relationship with the legislature. So to to hear that acknowledged um, in such a public way was really meaningful for me. So thank you. Um, secondly, and, and my last day is Friday. <laughs> so you guys are catching me um, a couple of days before I'm out of here. Of course, somebody had to throw a local election related curveball at me in my last week in the job. Um, it's what we do. <laughs> it's our way of thanking you. Uh, and and it's our desperate attempt to you know just get you back in the house go on one last time. <laughs> Um, if, right. That's what this was all about in the, in the end. Um, third, I do need to know, uh, that I, I am going to have to leave at about 10 of three. So I've got about 30 minutes. Hopefully we can do this in that time. It's, I got to pick my daughter up at the bus and there's nobody else here right now to do so. So I really can't not. Um, and so I'll try to be quick and then leave as much of the time as I can for questions. Great. And what I told, um, Ways and Means this morning was, uh, I know that this bill needs to move quickly, right? That's that's um, one of the most important parts of it because of the fact that the March 5th meetings have already been warned. And so while I otherwise might kind of look through language like this with a fine tooth comb and nitpick it and suggest some additions, deletions, um, I sp I've spent a lot of time looking at what's on the page in front of you now, and I do think that it would be workable past as is with the language that is there now. What it's going to require, and I'll get into that a little bit in the next five or 10 minutes, is a lot of additional kind of guidance um, and information from our office out to the clerks. But I think that um, we can fill the gaps with that guidance without the need for writing them into this session law um, at this point at this point in time. The other, the general message that I started with for ways and means is of course, um, this is going to be messy. It's going to be uh, frustrating and an additional burden on those clerks that have to pivot and react to a school district that might take advantage of this provision. And it's gonna be confusing for voters. I think we just have to accept that as a bottom line um, and do everything we can to mitigate, minimize um, those impacts, both the administrative burden on the clerks and the confusion among voters. Obviously, the legislature or those who've, who've given it their blessing so far have um, made the calculation that this making this change is important enough um, to kind of result in navigating those those changes for what's already you know, a local election annual meeting season that's already in process right now. Um, and I say that because to kind of set the stage, I think you all are aware, but for the the March 5th annual meetings, which is the, the standard annual meeting time for all towns, cities, and villages, and has also traditionally been a, a, a standard annual meeting time for a lot of school districts across the state, uh, those warnings were already required to be posted and have been posted this past Sunday. Um, additionally, so the warnings were posted on Sunday and the ballot deadline for those votes, for those districts that vote either the budget article or other articles by ballot is next Wednesday. It's a week from today. And just anecdotally with some exchanges with school districts and clerks who help them administer their elections, um, a week out from that, that process has started for a lot of them. They've either, you know, sent the finalized ballot proof to the printers for printing. Some may have begun printing. Some may have gotten them back by now. Um, but they, the deadline for them to have those ballots in hand and available for voters is next Wednesday. That's a deadline, right? It's not a, um, they don't have to wait until then. And so a, a number of them may already have these ballots ready and may have already started sending these ballots out. That deadline provision works in conjunction with another provision where it says, basically you start sending your ballots out to any voters who have requested early absentee ballots as soon as you get those ballots. So it says by 20 days before the meeting or whenever you receive the ballots, whichever happens first. 
and it tells them it's some old legal language actually in the absentee balloting chapter where it says they shall send the ballots forthwith after receiving them. Forthwith, I have always um, interpreted to mean as soon as possible. So as, as soon as you can after you receive the ballots. So we're in a situation here where there may be some school districts who have a meeting warned already and potentially may have even begun sending out ballots or at the very least printing ballots. I did will priest. Yeah. Looks yeah. like it. Hey, Will, if you can hear us, it looks like your connection is frozen. Turn the video off. And if you didn't just hear Representative Morgan, if it's possible to turn your video off, that might help. That's <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> wow. All right. Yeah. Now that is solution. <laughs> I have no idea what just happened there. The Zoom box just completely collapsed. I just re-entered. Um, so I think oh. you you had just finished Will saying acknowledging that there are likely districts uh, who have already started sending out their ballots. And at the very least have them printed and definitely have their warnings posted. So the, the most important points for our office to provide guidance on, and I sort of the way I, I, I framed it for the Ways and Means Committee was I wanted to make sure I was clear on what their intent was. And I think I am, and I do that the same with you all who are who are more the experts in a, in election administration. As somebody was asking initially, right, um, the way I read the language is that they can cancel just the budget vote and amend the currently posted warning in that regard. So I think you all know, too, although there's some common misconception out there, that school district annual meetings um, contain more business than just the budget vote. It's not just the budget vote. They have to elect their officers, clerk, treasurer, et cetera. They have to elect their board members that have terms up for election. And they may have other public questions, just questions like you get at your town meeting ballots um, that pertain to the school district. So, and as you were pointing out, Chair McCarthy before, right, there's a mixture among those districts in how they vote those various articles. They have the same three options that towns and cities do where they can be either from the floor or by Australian ballot for their budget article, their officers, and or their other business. And so there's all kinds of mixtures of those voting methods across different portions of the business, even within a district, right? But what's important here is that this legislation author authorizes them to cancel what may have been a previously warned budget vote. So with regards to the warning, and I, I think that is... Um, that is the approach you would want, and it, and it requires if you do that, to rewarn a budget vote later in the spring. They put a deadline of that on that of April fifteenth, but that rewarn budget vote on just the budget article would require another full thirty day warning. I think that's advisable. I think you wouldn't have wanted to to pass something that said they can amend the budget that's been warned right now and still vote it on March fifth. Because then you get into you know sufficient notice issues with voters, um, as well as sort of more complicated ballot issues because you would have to get the new number out to them in time to vote on March fifth. So I think the approach taken here to say we're going to mm -hmm. cancel that particular article or articles related to the budget and rewarn those on a full warning later in the spring is the right way to go. Where that leaves you though is that you may have the rest of the the business of the annual meeting occurring on March 5th. That's going to remain warned. The, the warning that's up there right now at the post office and everywhere else in town, there'll be a replacement warning put up as soon as possible after the school board votes to do this that has the budget article crossed out and makes very clear my guidance coming from our office always is whenever you're amending a warning in any kind of circumstances like this to make it as clear as possible that it's been amended and how it's been amended. You know, if the school warning is up there, and you've looked at it and walked past it once. If you just put up another one without a real clear indication that something's different, you're not. You don't have any reason to look at it again. And so, I really I encourage the clerks and their election workers to to make that as obvious as possible that there's been a change. 
And then, of course, there's going to be reach out through all of their other channels of communication with voters, their website, any email list they have, potentially newspaper publications, local papers, and I would say definitely on Front Porch Forum for all of them that regularly post town business notice on Front Porch Forum. So it does set up a situation where if they do this, you'll still have the school district meeting in whatever form it follows for all of the business that's been warned other than the budget. And then you're going to have the budget vote later in the spring, which will also get a full warning that as a general matter, that's that's just about really good, clear, um, voluminous communication with the voters on what's going on. That's magnified, right? Because as people have pointed out, not all districts are going to take advantage of this. So there may be some districts that are moving along on regular course and are going to vote everything on March 5th and aren't, aren't going to have a follow up budget vote. That makes it a little more difficult, for instance, from the state level for us to do any kind of blast consistent messaging. I think it's going to be most important for the messaging to come at a local level, what's going on in your town specifically, so that voters are clear on that. Um, so that's that's the approach to warnings, is amend the current warnings, post them in every place where they're posted now, do so as soon as possible after you hear from your board. I was, after I testified to Ways and Means, I started, I'll tell you guys, drafting a bulletin that I will be sending to all the clerks with at least our first round of guidance on this. I made it clear to them, it's not always entirely clear, it's a pretty common question, that the warning should be adopted and signed by the school board. The statute, actually, the school statutes allow for the Oh, uh, no, you first again, Will. We should get some questions in. Oh. We will absolutely. I just think I want to make sure that he has a chance to explain because I, I feel like he's already answered several, several of the questions. <laughs> Are we going to have possession of this bill? No, we will not have possession of this bill. Is House Education doing a drive-by also? This language has been close, closely coordinated between House Ed and House Ways and Means. I believe the bill is going to come out of Ways and Means, but um, so they had I'm a joint trying, hearing. I, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't know exactly. So I don't want to say on the record how they coordinated. Uh, I have enough trying to coordinate <laughs> what we're doing in here to, to know how House Ed and House Ways and Means yeah, are working yeah. together. <laughs> question basically was, was this a chair to chair thing or was the committee, were the two committees involved? I was brought in, in legislation. I was brought in late um, because uh, Representative Conlin and Representative Kornheiser had both been, um, had started to talk publicly about the idea. Um, so last week when they started to talk about the idea of um, changing the formula to a cents versus this percent uh, formulation, uh, they uh, made it clear that you know that that would make a number of reconsider their budget and the initial proposal um, that just kind of got floated out in, in one meeting I was in uh, was you know somebody threw out the idea of a mechanism that I don't think would have uh, worked very well and so uh, I raised my hand and said you know I think we need to have the Secretary of State and other people weigh in on this language. And now this is the first opportunity that there's been a draft to look at. But we have Will back, but that did not answer my question about the two committees. Uh, I, I can get that answer. I just don't yeah. know. Okay, thanks. Yes. That's all I need to. Yeah. All right, Will, sorry. No, I really apologize. I don't know what's happening with my Zoom feed. Uh, at least I'm able to jump right back on. So if it happens again, give me 15 seconds and I can jump right back in. Um, Sounds good. I have a couple of questions in the room, so I might just send, we'll use the pause. So Representative Hango and then Representative. Thank you. Um, my first question is absentee ballots that may have already been sent out. Um, if that school district of that um, that region that's already sent out, or that town rather, that's already sent out their absentee ballots, what happens to those absentee ballots that are returned early? It's a good question, and it actually lets me get into the last five minutes of what I was going to say and then completely open it up, which is, okay, so how do you deal with ballots? 
in in the the circumstance you just described, Rapango, the advice has to be the only real option. So if you've already sent out a ballot with the budget number and the budget vote that's now being revised, and maybe or maybe not, it has other business on that ballot too, right? But either way, when that comes back, you just have to ignore those. So if if it's a ballot with a bunch of other business, you'll run it through the tabulator, print the results, but you're just not looking at those results. That vote's been canceled. It has no effect. It's it's they voted on something that now isn't isn't up for decision and that all the voters won't have had an opportunity to vote on. There's there's no better way to approach that other than that's where you would get into do you do you send them you're not you're not creating a follow up ballot right now with the new budget to be voted on on March 5th. It's going to be voted on later in the spring with another full warning period. So you're not turning around and saying, don't vote on that, but vote on this before March 5th. What you want to do is still kind of honor the opportunity they've had to vote on anything else that was on that ballot, count those votes. And you're just, you're just ignoring, for lack of a better word, the results that come back. They'll be, they'll be incomplete and of no effect. Um, and so you just tell the clerks that that's, you essentially treat it like the article isn't there. Um, just that article. Just that article. And all the other stuff counts. Proceed with everything else in the same way. That's That's been warned. It's at its full warning. It's been up. It hasn't been changed. And the <laughs> thing for hand-counted ballots, that towns that don't have tabulators, I think there are a few towns left. Mm -hmm. Same thing, whether it's on a tabulator or not. Okay. And then to just complete that thought, right? So you might have sent out some, but not all. If you still have more to send out or if you haven't sent out any, my advice at this point, left with no better option, is that they can manually edit those ballots that they're sending out, by which I mean take a black magic marker and strike through the budget article and say postponed. Um, in addition to that, right, it would be my, my uh, guidance to them to try to include some kind of note in the mailing when the ballot goes out noting the budget article has been canceled by the board for the March 5th vote. It will be postponed and voted on later in the spring. You will see that reflected that it's been crossed out on your ballot. Don't bother voting the budget article. If they still go ahead and fill in that oval, the tabulator will read it when you run it through. But again, the clerk is just going to ignore that portion of the results because that article is not up for business at the meeting. Um, I was in thinking through the bullet and I was writing with them this morning. I think my guidance will be that if they do that for their absentee ballots that go out from here on out, they should do the same thing for the in-person ballots at the polling place and try and strike through that article on all the in-person ballots so that as much as possible, all the all the voters are getting the same form of ballot given to them. If they're lucky enough to have not printed them yet, they're waiting for that 20-day deadline uh, next Wednesday, then we would tell them not to print the budget article, omit it from whatever the proof is that they send to the printer if their board acts in that amount of time. I think for for clerks that may have had them printed already, haven't sent any out and used tabulators, this is where you get a little bit into the details, but I think it actually would be more difficult to go and get new tabulator readable ballots printed right now, because what that's also going to do is change the programming on the machine It'll change the setup of the ballot if that article is taken out. So then the, the ovals are in different positions and the memory card on the machine would have to be reprogrammed to, to accurately read that ballot. So they can do that. They can incur that additional programming costs and, and ballot design redesign, or they can go with the ballots they have now and put a big black magic marker through the budget article and say canceled. So one last question. Yeah, if you want to follow up and then I've got a couple other hands. Thank you. So um, if other um, items are on that ballot, which there are, that are being voted on um, that don't need to be amended or struck out, for instance, school board directors are being elected. If new school board directors are elected who did not participate in the budget development process and now uh, a new school board is seated on March 5th or 4th or whatever date it is, 6th. So new school board is seated. 
the budget yeah. hasn't been voted on because the board has just the previous board has decided to postpone the vote. So now you've got a new board. That's a pretty tight turnaround to have them back in voting on having a vote, having a budget ready to be voted on by April 15th. So how does, mm. how does that affect this process? I think what you described is true. The, the new board members take office upon election and then would be voting active members of the board at that point and would have to come up to speed pretty quickly to get a new budget article in place. I, that's, that's the nature of what we're faced with with this late change. So if, if the board were able to rework their budget, if the current board were able to rework their budget really quickly before March 5th, how would that be presented to the voters if a new board is seated on March 6th? Does that make a difference? Or would they have to wait until March 6th to rework their budget? Mm -hmm. There's no language to that effect. You're getting a little bit into, you know, school board machinations that are a little bit outside of my area okay. my domain. However, it would, but what I would say is that wh where the rubber meets the road is when the warning gets approved in terms of the election and in terms of the language that'll be presented to the voters. So that's 30 days. The deadline in here is April 15th. So that puts it in the middle of March by when they need to actually sign off on the warning. And that's, you know, they could have all kinds of preliminary votes on what the budget number maybe should be, but it's the vote when they decide what they're gonna post on the warning to the voters, that's that's the substantive one. And that probably should be after March 6th when a new board- This, this legislation is silent on that though, right, Will? It's, yeah. the, it's up to the districts, that whatever, whichever duly elected school board, and the reason we're trying to move this as fast as we are is that we want school boards to be able to get out if they're going to try to take advantage of this authority, they don't have to. But if they're going to look at the change in the formula that's in the first part of this bill and decide to do that, we want them to be able to make that decision as quickly as possible. I would guess, to Representative Hango's point, most of them are going to do that uh, with the, the currently seated board if we move this before the end of the month. I think they're going to know because they would have had that the existing school board would have had the opportunity during their budget process to make the decision about whether they were going to use all of the capacity that they had or whether they were going to do like what my school district did and you know do more of a you know tighter more conservative budget and so not every district is going to take advantage of this this is just an option that we're giving them but you know just because we are changing the formula but i'm guessing it's going to be the the all right, the the outgoing board uh, that will probably do it, just given the timeline, unless we take too long uh, to consider this bill. So I had a bunch of uh, short. So uh, Representative Cooper, do you have well, questions? it occurs to me that my question probably is not for him because it's not really about elections. I guess I was going to ask mm -hmm. him, but I could ask anybody. What's our timeline? I could ask you. Uh, I believe the Ways and Means wants to vote this out by Friday in order to give. But we don't have possession. Correct? No. So we're, so we're we really are just basically. We're here just here. Fielding sure. opinion. Right? Well, I think the Ways and Means Committee, uh, for instance, there's this issue around Act One authority. If they wanted us because we do election policy and we crafted Act One, this significantly changes Act One, what we did last year. Sure. Right, it said in in some ways for the districts who decide to uh, to rewarn their budget, it says you know you you originally had this flexibility that Act One gave you, but now we're just saying if you're changing it midstream, you have to have your new number voted on by April fifteenth. Um, am I right about that, Will? That's my understanding, and I, I did point out to Ways and Means this morning that in the very underlying school district law, they have flexibility in when they schedule their annual meeting in the first place. Uh, a range is given from March 15th until June 30th for school districts to hold their annual meeting. That's that's long time existing law. And there are certain school districts, I don't have the number or the names offhand, but that probably as a traditional matter have their annual meeting scheduled even after April 15th, but sometime before June 30th. 
And then I, I added the additional layer that there is the Act 1 authority you're talking about, which could, in theory, still be used, I think, to reschedule a meeting until July 1. My only other question was, uh, I think Will already answered. We don't know exactly how many districts are on, have already sent out their ballots. We, is that correct? We do not very few. Well, that was the time I did. Oh, yeah. I think you'll find people are just getting them printed right now, and they'll be available to mail generally, well, actually, I think, in about four or five is, days. Printing is as effective as mailing, right? It's creative. Yeah. yeah. It still exists. Will, can you just clarify that before we go to Representative Lee's question, which is, um, so many districts have sent their ballots to the printer, they're kind of receiving them now, but haven't mailed them to voters yet, the ones that are going to mail them to voters, or you know, just have them available uh, physically and start doing absentee ballots. So um, you had talked about those folks who get ballots, if their school uh, board decides to take advantage of this authority, if we pass this relatively quickly through both bodies and the governor signs it, um, they might be able to actually mark that the budget article has been canceled on those ballots before people have a chance to vote. Yes. It's going to be close. <laughs> And I just want to be clear that it's entirely anecdotal in what I've heard via a few emails as to what position various districts are in. I would suggest the school boards association may be able to do a survey. You know, my email list is town and city clerks, but the school boards association may have a superintendent contact list and or uh, board chair contact list that could quickly be used to try to gather that information. So I think this is for you, Will. Um, <clears throat> I know because this is such a special provision, uh, should there be something included in there that says that, you know, towns will still have to be required to warn the Article 30 days before that date of on or of April 15, 2024? I mean, <clears throat> you've stated that they've got to do it, but should it, should it be in this as well? Or are folks going to for sure know that it's not a special time um, without without it being in this? It's a good question. That was one of, one of the examples I was thinking of when I led off by saying I could nitpick it and suggest additional language to make it perfect. Um, but, but Rep Higley, it, by omission, since it says nothing else, it's a 30-day warning period for any vote, and that will be at least our office's clear guidance. Um, okay. Thank you. Representative Morgan, did you still have a question? Uh, no, I, I was just re clarifying, but I think Wilson, just real quick, is it, it is individually up um, to board by board by board, school board by school board by school board. It's their discretion, and it's not mandatory, it's not mandated, it's up to them individually. Yeah, so um, the, the, the construction here, my understanding is, and Will, correct me if I'm wrong, each uh, so this is saying, here's some extra authority. So the top part of this bill makes the change in the formula and does all the Act 127 stuff that Kirby's can answer questions on once Will's gone if, if, if folks need the context. But the piece we're looking at here in Section 3 says, if you change your budget and want to rewarn it, school board, so it's giving it a power to the, the school board. Yeah. Um, if you do that, then we'll help defray the cost of the additional printing, voting, et cetera, and um, that, you know, you have to have that vote no later than April 15th if you decide to do that. And so just given all the percentages and numbers, I think Representative Kornheiser said at caucus yesterday uh, that, you know, as many as you know, a third of school districts may be impacted in some way, but then there are districts that they actually were a little more conservative and didn't spend all the way up. And they may just decide, you know, our budget's as tight as we can make it. We're not going to do anything. There are others who were very public about saying, you know, we had an opportunity to do a capital improvement project that we've been waiting on for years without it having any tax impact. So we're just going to go ahead and grab everything that the existing current 27 formula would give us. And they, they essentially spent an extra three to five, six million dollars mm -hmm. that they might not have spent otherwise. And so the whole idea here is to give the school board the ability, if we're going to change the formula, 
to to rewarn their budget and mm-hmm. and vote on a budget that reflects the current tax policy because everything about the December first letter and the Act 127 formula, if we pass the first couple of sections of this bill, be really unfair and create chaos. I think to not give school districts the opportunity to go back and and rethink some of the decisions that we know have been made in, in at least some of the districts. Um, so, uh, Will, I know you need to go. So anybody, if, if, Representative Hango, is your question for Will? I'm not sure if it's for Will or Kirby. It probably could be either one. So. Is it about the elections mechanics? Yes. Okay, go ahead. That's for Will. <laughs> okay. Um, so this bill does not say anything about how the election will occur, how the balloting will occur. So this, my assumption is your whoever wrote the bill is thinking that everyone will go and vote in person again on another day, the date to be set sometime before April 15th. Is that correct? Or again, reach out to your town clerk to get an absentee ballot. So that's going to really require a ton of public attention to this to bring people's attention to it. Really good question. You've had a couple today that have reminded me things I wanted to say. Um, where I thought you were going first is, of course, the, uh, in terms of method of voting, whether it's voted at a floor meeting or by Australian ballot, would stay okay. the same. That's been adopted by the district as the method of voting their budget, right, for for all time. And so if they scheduled that rescheduled vote would follow that same method. But more importantly, and it's one of the, one of the only things I've might have wanted to have specifically called out in the bill in an ideal world, but will be part of my guidance is that if a person had an absentee ballot request for the school district uh, ballot for this currently scheduled meeting, they will be automatically sent one for the rescheduled meeting and will not need to make another request for that um, new vote. I think that's just in, in fairness to the voters, we should say that a request for this meeting that was then subsequently canceled at least one article of this meeting and and postponed that you shouldn't have to request another ballot. You know, it, all the steps are going to be to try and make sure everybody knows this is happening. And one of the easiest ways to do that would be to send a ballot to anyone who had a request for this vote. And with that, I do really have to run Chair McCarthy. Yeah. The It takes me about 10 minutes to go down there and get her at the end of the road and come back. I can email you if you're still in discussion and want me back, I can pop back in. I will, um, yeah, so if we, I think Ways and Means is looking for a recommendation from us, but we have, you know, they're, they're trying to get a bill out by Friday. So I think we're gonna uh, have a little committee discussion now. If there are other questions, we will get back to you. I'll shoot you an email. And if if we could get you back in for a few minutes tomorrow, if we need to, then I'll, I'll keep you on speed dial. <laughs> I was gonna say, I, I actually am pretty wide open tomorrow. Great. Well, very helpful. Um, thank you very much. We'll go get your guy. Thanks, everybody. All right. Representative Hango, go ahead. It's a lot. A third of the 120 something school districts are possibly affected by this. That's quite a few voters. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering how many of them are going to show up at the polls on another date to vote on this. And I know there's no answer to that, but I just wanted to bring that up that um, turnout could could be, I mean, we have enough trouble with turnout as it is. So I don't really know where to go with this. Yeah, this, this is one of those things that's a real conundrum. Go ahead, Reverend. No, I was just gonna say yeah. that piece and I know I'm like walking in like 90% of the way through the conversation. But with that, right, it's the it's the, the, the districts making the choice mm-hmm. to move. So they're making that calculation. <laughs> We're just providing them with the tools to have support to do so if they choose. So that's a yeah. Go ahead, represent. Are we is this speaking freely? We are, uh, yeah, it's community discussion. We don't. Well, that that brings up an interesting reality, right? That. We're basically signaling to districts that they have the option to produce a budget figure that is smaller than the one that they've already prepared. What gives them any inclination to do so? Why would they? So Kirby can answer that question, I think. 
Because we didn't talk about what the first part of this build does yes, exactly. <laughs> in any <Yeah>. detail. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, they're, they're going to have a strong incentive. For yeah, he's gonna the whole and right. just for your own for, for your premise, I frankly don't think that this bill even comes close to directly solve or even trying to solve a problem directly. This is basically an extension. It's the first step in a long process. Yeah, a long yeah. process that's never worked. Budgets don't ever go down. They just don't. And this uh, bill isn't about to do like it's anyway. Maybe he's got yeah. Game. Let's let's do this part, then we'll get back to that. <laughs> uh, Kirby Key, Legislative Council. So the the question is, what incentive might a school district have to reward a budget? Uh, so Section Seven of Act One Twenty Seven is repealed by the bill, which means no more uh, uh, five percent uh, tax rate cap for homestead properties. Uh, and also there's this tax rate review that's also being repealed that's related to that. Um, and instead it's being replaced with a percent decrease for tax rates, but only available for districts that had uh, less tax capacity is one way to put it without trying to get into a whole lot of math. Um, there's the reason why this is happening at all, of course, is because Act 127 changed how pupil weighting is done. And there were some districts that will have less tax capacity because their, pu their pupils won't be counted as, as highly as they used to. And then there'll be other districts that, have, that basically have more pupils, even though they don't necessarily gain students or anything, based on the weighting. Sure. And more pupils means more funding, right? Or more tax capacity. Right. So the, uh, instead of having a tax cap for everyone before, just the districts that have less capacity now. And that's measured in the bill as a relative decrease compared with the state share of tax capacity. The new pupil weights overall, I don't know if this is, is, is going to just confuse things or not, but overall tax capacity for the whole state went up because mm -hmm. of new pupil weighting. So that's why the, the bill looks at your relative increase or decrease compared with all the other districts. Okay. So compared with everyone else, are, are you have, do you have a lot less tax capacity or, or a negative tax capacity relative to the other district? Sure. Uh, so I, I believe, um, I'm not JFO, I don't have the numbers, but I, I do think it might, be yeah. more, it might be less than 50% of the school districts are, have that decrease in tax capacity. But under this, those are the only ones that will get a benefit. Otherwise, there's not, the 5% cap disappears and nothing replaces it right. for those that have increased capacity. So for a school district, for instance, that had, they had increased capacity, but they still took advantage of the 5% cap rate because of a capital project or, or just because they felt like other districts were doing it and they were gonna be left behind. I mean, lots of different reasons, right? They could have done that. Maybe their, their budget for this year was, their proposed budget was a lot higher than it would have been. Now that they're not capped at 5% and they learn that, that's your incentive to maybe go back and spend a lot less because it, uh, it would mean that the, the homestead uh, taxpayers in your uh, district are going to pay a lot less if you go do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so there'll be, um, and, the, and you know, the homestead taxpayers tend to be more like the voters. Uh, and those are the ones I believe that the school districts are more concerned with how they feel about it. So generally, this is basically the theory that we create the option for, I don't know, maybe not even 50% of districts to go back to the drawing board, assuming all of them did that, right? How much do you suppose, and I know you just said you're not JFO, you don't have the numbers, but percentages, maybe estimates, what would we say? Like, what would, I mean, it seems to me the problem that we're trying to solve here is the reality that in almost all districts, property taxes are simply too high and they will continue to go up and they will continue to go up next year and the year after, despite having done this bill. It's a non-solution to a problem that we are pretending to address. And that is problematic to me. So Representative Kornheiser has basically described this and she said this yesterday pretty clearly that there are a whole bunch of pressures. You're totally right. School budgets are going up. The one thing that we did though that exacerbated some problems that there is uh, a sort of universal recognition 
that, that we did not anticipate when we passed Act 127 was this idea that the mechanism that we used to give a, a glide path mm -hmm. for those districts that were going to lose tax capacity in order to solve some of the equity issues, um, that because so many of the budgets went up so much more than we would have anticipated all at once, like this year had kind of an unprecedented one year because of the perfect storm of 16% healthcare increase, uh, the ESSER funding going away, but districts still needing to keep a lot of the things that they were funding going. There are a whole bunch of factors that Representative Conlon, Representative Kornheiser's committees have been digging into. That's kind of not our bailiwick, but I think what you're getting at um, really appropriately is that this isn't going to solve all the problems. But what they've talked about is something on the order of districts who especially had like long-term capital needs that they just hadn't been able to fund. They had an opportunity because of Act 127 to spend $100 million more than they might have otherwise without it having a local property tax impact. And then that burden was pushed onto everybody else, right? So we can at least with this mechanism, oh, potentially fix that part of it. But you're totally right. This doesn't solve the whole problem, but it might solve like, if we think the problem is like 200 million, it might solve like 50 million of it, which isn't nothing. <laughs> Act 127, and I fully supported this enhancement, a really complex funding formula, but it's coming, it's becoming increasingly evident. The funding formula doesn't seem to work. And we don't seem to have political will in this building to address that, re that reality because we've done way too many years, sessions after sessions of work on policy that in theory, right, creates what all 50 states could hopefully consider the most theoretically equitable funding formula in public education. But it doesn't do that. So I think that's valid and that argument's gonna be happening for years. But right now what we have before us is a mechanism to address a chunk, right? But you're right. The question for us, and we've got to go up to the floor, but the question for us is, is this language around balloting and budget, the, did we get that right? The mechanics of that right? That's what Ways It Needs is asking for our input on. Um, I'm going to ask Will to come back again tomorrow yeah. afternoon. So look at this language overnight. Think about questions. We'll continue this discussion tomorrow afternoon.